afternoon. Uh, welcome to another edition of the Street Peace Coalition on Chicago Can TV, Channel 21 on your Chicago Comcast station. Welcome to our viewers and listeners via social media. I'm Minister Michael Muhammad, co-founder of the Street Peace Coalition. We are a grassroots violence intervention organization. We attempt to um, intervene in uh, areas in our communities and neighborhoods that have uh, been plagued by violence using a grassroots approach um, that's a little different from most other approaches that are being used by violence intervention and prevention organizations. Each week uh, we come to you on this station this season. This is our fourth season, I believe, uh, coming to you talking about the work of the Street Peace Coalition, talking about our, sharing with you our views, our assessments, our evaluations related to violence uh, in Chicago and violence in the black community in particular. This season, We've been trying to lay out uh, a schematic, a blueprint, a flow chart, a um, paint a picture, if you will, of what are the factors that contribute to the ongoing problem of violence, specifically in the black community. And so we've started by talking about the external institutions, social institutions that have tremendous impact on violence in the black community based upon their attitude, their perceptions, their philosophy, their policies, and their practices with regard to uh, black people in general, but specifically black men, and how these policies, practices, and outlooks uh, create, exacerbate, and reciprocate violence in the black community. And so uh, the last several weeks we've began to try to lay out how that's connected to the internal social institution we know as the black family and how this, uh, this institution has been broken apart by these external institutions of Chicago Public Schools, Chicago Police Department, Chicago Housing Authority, uh, Cook County Jail, IDOC, Illinois Department of Corrections, all the way up to DEA, ATF, uh, all the way into the White House. All of these uh, institutions have been complicit in um, the proliferation of drugs and illegal guns in the black community, as well as the proliferation of an ideology that we say is rooted in white male supremacy in the notion that black men have to be demonized, have to be monsterized, have to be viewed by the larger society, by most folks in society, must be made to fear, uh, loathe, or even hate the ideal, the sight, or the presence of black men in particular, including black women and children are made to feel this way about their own brothers, uncles, fathers, sons, and husbands, and boyfriends, etc. And so what we've been trying to talk about is ways in which in a city where we have over 600 people this year that have been uh, murdered by guns, we have over uh, 2, 000, almost 3,000 people that have been shot and wounded in this city. We have well over 3,000 people total that have been affected by gun violence, either by serious injury or death, and well over 600 homicides in this city, uh, vast majority black-on-black -black homicides. What can the black community do? in light of the great forces arrayed against it uh, to reverse this notion of black-on-black -black violence. And so we're, we've been talking about the fact 
that the black man is so critical to um, either exacerbating violence or remediating violence. And so statistically it is said uh, by study that a black child or a child in general really is uh, 11 times more likely to grow up and become violent if they do not have a healthy ongoing relationship with their father. It is also reported by government st statistics that 63% of youth suicides happen with young people that do not have a positive relationship with a father in their life. 90% of juveniles who are homeless are also juveniles who have no father in their life. 85% of juveniles and youth who have been classified or demonstrated uh, behavior problems, 85% of those young people have no father in their life. 80% of young people, teenagers, adolescents, juveniles, who are found uh, uh, guilty or known to be rapists, commit the act of raping a female or a male, 80% uh, of those young people have no father in their life. 71% of all high school dropouts have no father in their life. 75% of all teenage mothers who, not only being pregnant, have a substance abuse problem and are committed for treatment, 75% of all of those young people have no father in their life. And so the black man is key to getting to the root of this violence. The fact that black family has been under assault since 1960 until this very day is very, very, we cannot overstate the relevance of the fact that since 1960, family in general in America, but specifically the black family, has been under assault in the United States of America. And so as it is written in, uh, as it is written, uh, you cannot uh, spoil the strong man's goods unless you first bind the strong man. And so what that means is, this is a thought out social phenomenon. This is not a random social phenomenon. This is very uh, calculated. It's very meticulous in pinpointing and targeting the separation of black men from the ideal, having a healthy ideal about themselves as men, having a healthy ideal about themselves as mates, having a healthy ideal about themselves as fathers, uh, we are nurtured out of a healthy self-identity. And so if you want to understand how you create angry, rageful, hostile, hyper-aggressive, violent men, then you have to look at the root causes. And that's what we're doing. So I, I want you who view this now or later to understand this is not rhetoric. We got to go beyond rhetoric. We got to look at the facts. And the facts may be painful. They're certainly painful to most, uh, most of us in society because we don't, we don't deal with facts. We deal with emotions. And so when we start hearing the facts, we hear them from emotions and we don't understand how controlled our environment is, how controlled our society is, and how uh, um, regulated our behavior is from birth into adulthood by these social factors, social institutions, and social phenomena. Caller, are you there? Caller, you have a question or a comment? Yes, sir. How you doing, my friend? This is Ray. Hi, Ray. You know, you know like, I always mostly agree with you. But when I was growing up, when I went to high school, I graduated, I went for a job. I went to work for the CTA. All my friends 
African American, Mexican, you know, all of that. We all had families. We didn't worry about the government. We went to school, we learned, we got a job, and then we were there to make a family and support them. You don't have that now. All you have is young girls having five or six babies by five or six different men, and then you want to blame the, the government. The government didn't tell that young lady and that young man to go get pregnant. So you can't blame it on society itself. There, now, I agree with you that there are programs that really messed up African American and Hispanics. But if you have a mind, if you go to school and you do what you're supposed to do, nothing, none of that is going to matter. Thank you, my friend. Yes, thank you for your call again, Ray. However, you have to understand that young people do not make themselves. Whatever you are as an adult, there, as, as a child, there were adults helping you to frame your thinking, your attitudes, your behaviors. There were social norms that made certain thinking, certain attitudes, and certain behavior either acceptable or unacceptable. And so it is a fact that we can, in fact, blame the government for its attack on black family. In fact, we can blame the government for its complicity in the lowering of social norms, social standards. And so when we talk about uh, reproductive behavior, the government has played a role and spent hundreds of millions of dollars to run ads in every form of media to uh, be complicit with Hollywood and the music industry to put out certain messaging about what is acceptable when it comes to reproductive and social behavior. These things are, we as the superficial, dumbed down members of society that really believe that uh, everything that comes on television is simply about entertainment, not understanding that everything that comes on uh, television is about two things. The first thing is about conditioning, mental programming. The second thing is it's about economics. And so what is the messaging? And how is the government involved in that messaging? And that messaging produces a behavior in society. It produces a way that men look at women. That's why we have now this big scandal in the United States of America that has emerged after, uh, you know, uh, 500 years, really, uh, of culture that has gone on in, in, in a white male dominant society where it has been the socially acceptable behavior of white men that they take advantage of women in any way that they feel is acceptable. This is not new. It's just beginning now to come to an head uh, because of social phenomenon. But the government has, the government was behind the crave for cigarettes, the crave for alcohol. The government is behind all of these social behaviors, including how we view our interaction between each other as men and women, what's acceptable sexually and what is unacceptable sexually. The government has a heavy role to play in it in complicity with large corporate interests in America who always want to position us in a way that they can exploit our ignorance, our lack of information and knowledge, the laziness of us as a people, the, the need to make us more a consumer population that responds to emotional stimuli versus critical thinking. And so you, Ray, sound as though you may be in the baby boom generation and the baby boom generation was the last generation uh, was the last generation that came up under social norms where family was being um, 
the messaging around family was that it was the social norm to get married, to make a woman respectable, to get married before you have children. And when you have children, do everything you can as a man to be there for your children and provide for your children. And as a woman, you should, you should encourage and support and nurture your man and your children and build and, and be a part of a, a socially uh, a, 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 a intact uh, a social unit called the nuclear family. So the further you get away from the baby boomer generation, there is an assault on the family and there's a transformation of social values away from the nuclear family to the liberated idea that I can have sex when, where, however I want to and I don't need to make any commitment to the woman if I'm a man and if I'm a woman I don't need to make any commitment to the pregnancy because now Roe versus Wade has made me feel I have the power to end this life if that's what I so to all of these are cues social cues that are handed down through mass media education as well as legal renderings etc that make their way into the social fabric that stimulate a certain thought and behavior about how we perceive ourselves as men and women and so this is going on in the broader society but in the black community it was federal policy that pushed black men out of out of out of our homes it was federal policy that made us have to go to jail if you had a joint in your pocket you got the same time as somebody with eight ounces of cocaine. It, it, it was federal policy that, that made us have to do long extended it, uh, abnormal sentences for petty crime. This was federal policy to take us out of our homes. Go ahead, Carl, and make a, uh, a qu uh, question or comment. Out of our homes. Go ahead, Carl, and make it, uh, Hello? Yes, please turn your television down and make your question or comment. Okay, I will. Uh, just one what, one question, uh, you mentioned the uh, role of the families. I know we can go back, you know, when I was growing up at 47 Indiana down in next to Gladys's, we had a, low, a rule that when the street lights came on, we had to be in the house when we were 13 and 14. The street lights were our clock. Now, at, at 8 o'clock at night or 12 o'clock, you got a 13 or 14-year-old kid in the streets getting shot or shooting somebody, and then we blame the police. You know what's wrong with us, brother? There's no parenting anymore. There's no parenting. We need to do it block by block and educate the parents how to be parents and stop blaming everything on the government or the police. Let's do our job. I know I was in the school system for 35 years. I saw it. It can be done. We got to step up to the plate, and I mean real men, not males. I don't mean the males who are walking down the street with the pants below their butts. I don't mean those kind of males. I mean a real man. Thank you, sir. Thank you, caller, for your comments. I agree with you 90%, but what I want to encourage everybody that's uh, viewing this, keep up with our monologue to you. Okay, and if you and if you're just tuning in the first week, take a little time and go back and see how we've progressed to this point where we're at tonight. We have to blame the the social institutions because again, human beings do not make themselves into what they become. We are factors of our environment. So we have to look at those who lead, who's, who design, who engineer, who control our environment. You cannot dismiss them in their complicity. Those are external institutions. What I've been trying to do is pivot to the internal institution and how it connects to the internal institution known as family and the role that parents or the lack thereof have in producing an effect on young people. So I gave out a litany of statistics of the impact of the absence of fathers on children. And so what I'm laying out to you, if you would uh, bear with me and do your own homework, you will understand that the absenteeism 
of fathers in homes in the black community is an unnatural thing. It is not the norm for black men who are psychologically and emotionally healthy. So how did we become so psychologically and emotionally unhealthy and dysfunctional? We didn't do it to ourselves, okay? There may, so something has happened. There's something in the social engineering of our social norms and standards as it relates to black people that has been afflicted on black men without our knowledge. And so you can say so-and-so smoked, they got lung cancer, they died, that's their fault. But that's a very superficial thing. It's true at a very uh, fundamental, superficial level. But if you start doing the research on how much advertising was used, how doctors were used to target the American public, how the military was involved to target the American public and make the American public believe that it was healthy to smoke and that it took 30 years later for them to get beyond the point where they could hide the truth from the American public, you will see that the people who were damaged by smoking, yeah, they made a bad choice personally, but they were the victims of social engineering. So you cannot let the military, the medical profession, the tobacco industry, and the government off the hook simply by saying somebody made a personal choice. No, they were, their personal choice, look, it is known, good people, just think with me. Every study that is ever conducted on the power of advertising, every time they study the phenomenon of advertising and marketing, they come up with the same conclusion that 60 to 70 percent of every decision we make to spend our money has been influenced by some type of conscious and subconscious programming known as advertising and marketing. In other words, we think we're making a choice of our own volition, but we have been pre-programmed to make selections and choices that have been put in front of us without our knowing. Go ahead, caller, with your comment or question. Are you there, caller? Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Please hurry. We're running out of time. Yeah, it's all uh, right. Rabbi Smith. Um, I would like to make a comment. First, I thank you for your programming. Uh, far and far foremost, I think it's insulting when we have non-Africans that are born within the United States to actually make comments about what our behavior patterns are, how we were raised, and how we are viewed. If you have not had that black man's experience, how do you, with common sense, think that you know what we have endured? Not only has it been psychologically, but it's been spiritually. It's been naturally. It's been financially. In every aspect of life, the only attack that I have seen in 60 years is an attack against a man of color. Yet you can't make it without him. You need his resources. You need his land. Every city within the state of New York is still named after a Moor, an original black man. It's not going to change. Our government don't even say need to change it. But it's a fact of the matter for what's happening in Libya. Please hurry. I got 20 seconds left. I think you understand and I appreciate your programming, but I think it's insulting for someone to make a comment about me and you know you haven't lived me. Thank you, Rabbi, for your call. I agree with you 100%. Uh, nothing else to say about that except amen. And so I, I've got about 30 seconds left. So I want to make a heartfelt appeal to the you. Thank you all for, for tuning in. But I want you, I want to appeal to you to understand that I'm not just here uh, to spout rhetoric. I, I want you to do your homework. I want you to understand um, that a human being is the most complex organism in the universe. 
And whatever we become as adults is the byproduct of what has happened to us in our human development. And we need to understand the role that government, government institutions, across the board, as well as the adults that are responsible for us, the role they play in what we become. And understanding that that connects to uh, violent behavior in a very clinical, very methodical, very scientific way that we need to begin to look at and better understand. So I thank you again for tuning in to us this week. I'm going to sign off for the Street Peace Coalition. We'll see you next week, God willing. Thank you.